Hello everyone and welcome to the first and hopefully of many Forge lesson. Today we will talk about time and more specifically about global time and delta time. Before we begin, just a small disclaimer. All of this was filmed and designed on the leak build of Forge and things might differ on the release build. So let's say we want to move a cube from one point to another. We could achieve this by incrementing every frame the position of the cube by a constant amount towards the destination. Great, that's exactly what we wanted. Now, this example was made at 30 frames per second. How about we give it another shot at 60? Oh, the cube was two times faster and that is definitely not something we want. But thankfully, the delta time is here to save us. To make it really simple, delta time is the time elapsed between two frames. To compute this delta time, we just need to take the difference between the current time of the frame and the time of the previous frame. Back to our cube. The trick here is to assign a velocity to the cube that is expressed in distance per second, and for each frame, the distance to move the cube is simply the velocity times the delta time. Like this, even with different frame rates, we still have a constant speed for the cube. Awesome! Now, let's switch to Halo Infinite. So to get the time in the scripting graph, you just have to get the node for it. Oh, wait, it doesn't exist. So how will we do it? Well, I think I figured out a consistent way to get the global time, and thus the delta time. Thankfully, 343 provided us the translate to point node that smoothly translates one object from one point to another. And this is not 100% confirmed, but I'm pretty sure that the object will have a constant speed regardless of the frame rate, because probably internally they use a delta time system. I trust them on this one. Using this node, we can move a cube on a constant speed for a few meters for a precise amount of time. If we know the total distance to travel, the current distance traveled, and the total time it would take to complete the travel, we can infer the current time with this equation. The current distance divided by the total distance times the total time. And since we implemented a looping system, we just add the number of loops. So let's implement that on Halo Infinite. So we're back on Halo Infinite. Let's start to define all the variables we'll need. Let's first declare the object we'll use to make the timer. Here we'll just use a simple foreigner block. Then let's declare the starting point which will just be the initial position of the block. Then the endpoint, which is just 200 units further on the y-axis. And then we compute the distance between those two points. Finally, we declare the amount of time the block should take between the starting point and the endpoint, the amount of time the timer looped, and lastly, the global time value. Let's make the event that will move the object in a loop. We first start by setting the object to the starting point. Then, we will use the translate object to point node to move slowly the block to the endpoint. This node will pause the execution of the event until the block reaches its destination. Once the block reached the endpoint, we increase the loop counter and we trigger again the event, making it an infinite loop. When the game starts, we trigger once this event. Now that we have the object moving, we can make the function that will compute the global time when requested. We just need to implement the expression we saw earlier. First, we'll get the distance between the starting point and the current position of the block. Then we divide it by the total distance, add the loop amount, and finally, multiply it with the moving time. We put the result in the global variable time. Ok, so now let's test that what we did actually works. Let's write a quick script that just moves one sphere a few units away from its position using a tick loop and the delta time. For that, we need first to implement the delta time. We just need to calculate the difference of time between the previous tick and the current one. So let's declare two variables. 
want to keep track of the previous time and want to store the delta time. Let's now make a function to compute all that. We first call our function to get the current time. We then subtract the current time with the previous time to get the delta time. And lastly, we update the previous time with the new time. Now for the movement of the sphere. We first need to define three variables, one called stop y, that defines where the sphere needs to stop, another one called velocity, which is how many units per second the sphere will travel at, and lastly, a count variable to keep track of how many iterations of the tick loop we did to achieve the stopping point. For the loop itself, it's pretty basic. We create an event that will be called every zero seconds, basically every frame, then we compute the delta time, we check if the sphere has not reached the stopping point, and if it's still not there, then we add to the position of the object the velocity times the delta time and update its position. We also increase the counter. When the sphere reached its destination, we print the counter. Now let's see if it worked. It worked! And we can see that the movement function was called around 3000 times. On this clip, the frame rate was around 100 frames per second. Let's see what happens if we do it at 24 frames per second. As you can see, if we put the two clips side by side, the sphere travels at the same speed. Notice that on the slower frame rate, the movement function was called only 300 times. Awesome! We have successfully used the delta time to have a consistent movement, regardless of the frame rate. As a final little demonstration, let's have fun and let's make a bouncing ball. Before implementing it, we need to think of a simple approximation of the physics of such a complex model. After multiple PhDs in mechanical and quantum physics, we can assume that the acceleration of the ball will just be the gravity, and once the ball collides with the floor, we will invert the velocity and damp it a bit. Okay, so we'll reuse what we did on the previous script for the delta time. Let's create three new variables, one for the gravity, it's set as a negative value because it points toward the floor, and 20 because it looks nice, I guess. We need another variable to keep track of the velocity, and a final one that is called floor y, that is just the y value of the floor. So, for every frame, we first compute the delta time, then we update the velocity by adding to it the gravity force times the delta time. After that, we simply add the velocity times the delta time, to the current position and update the position of the ball. Now, for the extremely complicated part, to handle the collision, we check if the y-coordinate of the ball is below the floor, if yes, then we invert and damp the velocity, and just to prevent any weird behavior, we move the ball at the floor level. Now, let's see how it looks. Magnificent. It worked flawlessly. This will conclude this first Forge lesson. I hope you enjoyed this video. Let me know in the comments below what would you like to see next. Feel free to leave a like and maybe subscribe to my channel. Happy forging! and I hope to see you soon.